book of the Bible called Jude. If you've got your Bible, find it in the New Testament. It's written by Jesus, half-brother, uh, a great man of God named Jude. And um, I'm just gonna skip my notes. I'm just gonna verbal process with you. You tell me in five minutes if this is helpful or not. Um, <laughs> So as we get into this uh, sermon, it's a constant head-on collision between uh, the word of God and the world. It's a constant head-on collision. And, uh, and I want you to know my motive. I just feel like I need to share that with you. So I didn't grow, how many of you didn't grow up in a Christian home? I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And so I, I didn't know that there were you know, Christian bands and I didn't know that there were Christian books and Christian movies. And, and I missed all of the evangelical subculture. And I, I thank God every day, honestly, I do. <laughs> Um, and so uh, God saved me at the age of 19 in college. Um, a cute gal gave me a Bible and, uh, and I, I got saved reading that Bible. I married that girl. We just celebrated 31 years of faithful marriage. And, um, and I always say, if you're a single guy, here's how it works. If she gives you a Bible, you give her a ring. That's, that's a good deal. Um, and so then I started teaching the Bible in uh, uh, a city uh, called Seattle that was very, very liberal, very progressive, uh, very, very left of left of left of left. And I started doing college ministry. And if you wanna see where the future is going, head to a college campus because college campuses are upstream. So what's being taught there will be lived in the rest of the culture within a few decades. And so if you wanna know where we're going, go to a college campus. So I got saved in college. I started ministering largely to college students in a very liberal progressive city and uh, started teaching through books of the Bible. And I've been a senior pastor now for, this is my 28th year. And I've been a pastor for 30 years teaching through books of the Bible. I'm 53, I know I don't look a day over 85, but I'm 53. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and I spent most of my life teaching books of the Bible. And so I wanted to teach the Bible to people who didn't grow up in church and didn't grow up knowing Jesus. And so we started with college students, a lot of punk rock kids. It was back in the grunge days. Um, you know, it smelled like unholy spirit, uh, the, kind of the Nirvana years. And, uh, and, and then... And then all these kids started coming and they had no church background, they had no um, Bible background, no faith background. And I was telling them about Jesus and they were punk rock anarchists, very, very, very left. And I, I kid you not, one of my first Bible studies, we had to do it outside during the summer because everybody smoked and uh, they wouldn't come to the Bible study unless I let them smoke. So we had the Bible study outside. Uh, those kids were the smoking section and they were headed toward the eternal smoking section. So they really <laughs> needed the, uh, the Bible study. So next thing you know, uh, all these people are getting saved and they're all punk rock and they're all young and they're all progressive and they're all, they've all got tattoos and they all smoke and they're all anarchists. And, uh, and so next thing you know, everybody, the media started to think that maybe I was a new progressive pastor. And so I got calls from uh, like National Public Radio and Mother Jones and these other far left organizations. And they're like, hey, we heard you're progressive. I was like, I'm not actually, um, I'm the opposite. Whatever, whatever is the other team, I'm the other. I said, everybody around me is progressive, but, but don't let the tattoos and father wounds fool you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Bible believing Christian. And, and then I got put in this uh, group. It was a young leaders network. And I got invited to speak at my first conference about kind of where culture's at and where culture is going. Well, next thing I know, I'm kind of in this progressive lane of like urban, hip, cool Christians. Obviously this was a long time ago. Um, a long, long, before most of you who are cool were even born. And, um, and so, but, and, and then out of that came something called the emerging church, which was actually the submerging of the church. And uh, it was this progressive liberal movement within evangelical Christianity. And I stood against it as a Bible teacher and got a lot of conflict and controversy. Well, that movement has now grown up in our day. And what we're seeing is progressive Christianity, woke Christianity, generational apostasy, deconstruction of the church, trying to reimagine Christianity. That's what's going on. And so my heart is, I'm not just against those people, I'm for the Lord. And we do live in a day when everything seems to be, well, are you on the left or are you on the right? And I'm like, well, are you going north or are you going south? That, that, that seems to me to be far more significant of an issue. Are you for or against the Lord? And ultimately, the, the myth of progressivism is this, and I'm gonna, 
I'm gonna talk about progressive Christianity today. And uh, we're in Jude 11 through 16. What does God think of progressive Christianity? And, and let me try and explain this to you. And I, I, it's still coming together. So uh, by the third service, uh, this is gonna be a great sermon, but you guys are the first draft. So, so let me say that whether you're a uh, conservative or progressive, wherever you happen to be politically, culturally, or spiritually, there's one thing that I think that we can all agree on, and that's that this world is broken, okay? There's very few things left in our world that everybody would say, I, I agree with that. Our world is broken. I think we can all agree with that. And it's, it's like, well, we're not happy. We're not doing well. We're not flourishing. The future looks very scary, not very hopeful. And, and it seems like, Hypothetically, even if you don't know the Bible, it seems like something went wrong and, and, and something needs to change to make it right. And then what happens is there are two basic uh, diagnoses of the problem and prescription of the solution. One is in the church and one is in the world. And in the church, the solution is that I am the problem, not the solution. And, and Christianity begins with, I am a sinner and I have sinned against God. And until I get right with God, I'm not gonna get anything right. Until me and God are reconnected, I'm going to be disconnected from any meaning and purpose in life. And I can't save myself and I'm not part of the solution, I'm part of the problem. And so God came to save and to rescue me. His name is Jesus Christ. And that Jesus came and lived the life I've not lived and he died the death I should have died. He rose from death, conquering Satan's sin, death, hell, the wrath of God. He gives me a gift called salvation, relationship, eternal life that I didn't earn. Jesus right now returned to heaven. He's ruling and reigning. He's high and exalted. He's on a throne. He's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. And he's still working on me. And he's got a lot of work to do. And ultimately he's going to return and he's going to judge sin, he's going to open heaven, he's going to lift the curse, and he is gonna right every wrong. That's our hope. Okay, for the Christian, that's our only hope, amen? Now, now, in the world, there is a different series of diagnoses and prescriptions. And it is this progressive myth that we are good and getting better. And it's part of this evolutionary ideology that I'm good, not bad that I'm getting better, not worse, that the world is getting brighter, not darker, that things are trending up, not trending down. And within that, the only thing that really separates what the world would say and what the church would say is the word of God. It is the literal dividing line between the church, which is connected to heaven, and the world, which is connected to hell. And in every generation, this powerful delusional myth of progressivism, that we are good, that we are improving, that we are getting better, that if we could just remove old ideas, old religions, old commitments, old categories and old books like this one, then we could lift the lid on human potential. We would make significantly more progress. We'd all be doing better. And that's half true. But what's also true is not only would we be more effective because we're evil, we'd be more effective at doing evil, which is not progress, it's death. And so in every generation, there is this progressive force that wants to remove the word of God, overtake the church of God and eradicate the line between the world and the church. Now, that being said, this is exactly what was happening in Jude's day. And just so you understand, um, the Bible isn't an old book, it's an eternal book. That means it's not in the past, it means it's over all the times. The result is the Bible doesn't just tell us what happened, but what always happens. And what was happening in Jude's day is happening in our day. Those who are in the church are facing incredible pressure to either diminish God's authority through his word or to remove it altogether. And so what happens is Jude is Jesus' half-brother. And this conflict is so great between the culture of hell and the world and the culture of heaven and the church that they needed someone with the highest potential authority to determine whether or not they should continue being loyal and faithful to God's word as God's people had for thousands of years. 
And here's what he says in Jude 3. He says, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. What he's saying is this, hold the line, keep the line. There is a difference between the world and the church. And when all is said and done, my friend, you need to know that there will only be two cultures in the end, heaven and hell. And we live in the time between the times. We live in the middle. And every day we make decisions and those decisions will either pull hell up into our life or invite heaven down into our life. As soon as we remove the word of God, we do not bring heaven down, we bring hell up. And this contending is a military word. It means that there's going to be a struggle. There's going to be a fight. And that fight is absolutely, certainly underway in our day. And, and, and so what's happening in their day, as well as our day, is something called um, deconstructionism. It's a, it's a philosophical term. And um, again, I'm ver this is my introduction. Some of you are like, this is a weird sermon. No, the weird sermon is coming. This is the introduction to the weird, this is the weird introduction to the weird sermon. So what happens is, how do we remove the Bible? How do we remove the church? How do we remove Christianity? Well, we need to deconstruct it. And there are two basic ideologies that have driven human history. One is called traditional theory. The other is called uh, critical theory. Traditional theory is how do you build a church, a marriage, a family, a culture, an economy? Deconstruction is we see that it has failures and faults and flaws because it was architected by people who are fallen and flawed and sinful. Therefore, we will dismantle, we will deconstruct. And that's what we're seeing in our day. We've deconstructed gender, we've deconstructed family, we've deconstructed marriage, we've deconstructed law enforcement, we've deconstructed the Bible, we're deconstructing Christianity. Everything seems like it is just in demolition mode. And um, I'll give you a free book. I've, I've, I've written on this and I can't get into all of it today, but it's Christian Theology versus Critical Theory. And I'll give you a free copy. And I try to explain all of this. And I want you to read it if you wanna be a nerd and spend a little time with me. So, so just one other thing, maybe. Um, how about four other things? Um, <laughs> before I get into Jude. Um, number one, change is not always progress. This is one of the lies of the progressive myth, that if we get further from the past, things will get better in the future. How many of you have tried something, you've changed something, and it got worse, not better? So the myth is today that new is improved. It's like, well, we have a, we, we have a new version of Christianity. We have new interpretations of the Bible. We have, we have new things that God is saying. New is not always improved. And just because something is changed doesn't mean it's better. Number two, uh, so how many of you are younger? How many of you are in your teens, 20s, okay? Um, you are lab rats for a generation of false prophets. You are lab rats for a generation of false prophets. They have fed you uh, from birth the lie that you are good and getting better and that change is progress. And what you are part of, because this is the only life you've lived and some of us have lived a little while longer, it's like, well, what happens if, uh, what happens if we uh, just have a child looking at a screen from uh, the crib for the rest of their life? Like, I don't know, let's see. Well, what happens if we expose them to pornography at a, at a very young age? I don't know, let's see. Well, what if we sexually confuse them and cause lots of gender confusion? What's gonna happen? I don't know, well, let's see. Well, what if we give them you know, puberty blockers or surgery or hormones? What happens to their developing body? I don't know, let's see. Well, uh, what happens if we legalize or decriminalize drugs? What I don't know, let's see. It's not going well for you because you are a lab rat for a generation of false prophets. And a false prophet is one who says something will happen and it doesn't. You're gonna get better. Things are gonna get stronger. Uh, the culture is gonna get healthier and your mental health will improve. False prophets. Number three, how many of you are creatives? I can tell, right? You're, you have tattoos, you have colored glasses, you wear cool clothing. Um, you notice I wear all black because I, it's dangerous to do anything. I'm not that creative. Some of you are very creative. We, we can tell, right? Your hair's colored, your glasses are colored. You're, you're, you're cool. Like we, we, we wanna hang out with you, you're cool. 
And let me say this, it's fine to be creative with your wardrobe, it's fine to be creative with the interior design, it's fine to be creative um, with your personal style, but not with your Christian convictions, okay? You can find creative new ways to express old truths, but you don't create truths that are new because the truths are eternal. And what we're seeing is this woke, aggressive, uh, apostate generation is largely being driven by artists, musicians, and creatives. And they're getting creative with the Bible and their gender and the church and Jesus in ways that they should not. Um, I'll just leave it there. So there's the introduction. That's what I was thinking about uh, before I got up. So that being said, what we're gonna do now, we're gonna open the book of Jude and we're gonna look at the battle that they were having between the church and the world over the word of God. And Jude is trying to establish the authority of God's word so that the world doesn't invade, overtake, and deconstruct and destroy the church. So we'll jump right in. Everything God creates, Satan counterfeits. Satan is nothing but like a really crummy cover band. He doesn't come up with any new material. He just does a crummy version of what God does. So he starts with the counterfeit trinity. Jude 11, woe to them. So this is Jesus' brother and the woe there is a curse. What it's saying is you have opposed God and you are going to live a life that is cursed and not blessed by my brother, Jesus Christ. For they walked in the way of Cain, abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir and perished in Korah's rebellion. That's the counterfeit trinity, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. So he's going back to the Old Testament. So in their day, again, they're like, we've progressed beyond the Old Testament. We progress beyond the old books of the Bible. We've progressed beyond the old stories. And Jude's like, no, you haven't. Actually, those tell us exactly what's happening in our day. The first is Cain. And these are apostates. Apostates are people who uh, are with God's people and may even say they're one of God's people, but they're God's enemies. It's like treason in battle. They turn and fight for the other side in the battle. Jesus says, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so Cain is the first example of apostasy and it's his apostasy is motivated by unrepentant sin. So if you wanna look at it, it's in Genesis chapter four, there was Adam and Eve, and then they had two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain was the older brother. He was the first born person in human history. The first human being ever born of a mother and father. He's the first guy with the belly button, right? So that's Cain, <laughs> Cain. And what happens is he and his brother, they're working jobs. And, uh, and, and just by the way, if you're a, if you're a guy, get a job. Um, just, just a little, just a pro tip from your mom. Um, so, so what happens is they both get honorable jobs. Cain is a farmer and Abel is a rancher. These are fine jobs. And they both come to worship in God's presence. It would have been their version of church. And they bring in their hands offerings or sacrifices to the Lord from farming and ranching because that would be the first fruits of their business. Tangentially in the Bible, when people come to worship God, they always come with something in their hands because worship is to sacrifice and to give. So they come to give. And what happens is God looks at Cain and Abel, God receives Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. And I believe it's not because what they brought in their hands was right or wrong, but what they brought in their heart was right and wrong. What was, in their, what was in Cain's hand and Abel's hand? Perfectly fine. What was in Cain's heart? Not good. Abel's heart was pure. God looks at Cain and he knows his heart. And, when you, and, and you can come to worship and have murderous thoughts and anger and bitterness and vengeance in your heart. And God looks at Cain and he says, uh, you're angry. There, there's a problem in you. I don't know if he was bitter. I don't know if he was jealous. I don't know if he was wrongly ambitious but he was angry and he warned him. He said, sin is crouching at your door and you, you've got to deal with it before it destroys you. I'm summarizing Genesis four. It got me thinking, um, we moved here uh, about seven or eight years ago and I'll never forget the one day I opened the door to our house and there was a bobcat, bobcat. It was right by the door. Okay, let me just say this. If, if there's a bobcat outside of your door, 
Do not open the door, amen? I mean, just don't even pray about it. Just don't even open the door. Because let's say there was a bobcat that was sort of hiding right by your front door. You open the front door, what's that bobcat gonna do? Gonna get into your house. And then what's gonna happen? Devastation. What he's saying is this, that sin sits and crouches and waits at the door and waits for us to crack open an opportunity to let it in and to destroy us. That's what he's saying. So he's saying, hey, this sin is crouching and if you open the door, it's going to enter in and gonna destroy your life. Well, rather than repenting of his sin and owning his sin, what Cain does is he gets more angry and he plots to murder Abel. So they're out in the field, no one's around. He forgets that God sees and knows all. And what happens is he commits premeditated murder. He slaughters his brother, Abel. And then he tries to cover the crime. And then God confronts him. He's like, where's your brother? He's like, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Basically like, I'm not his babysitter, I don't know. God's like, you do know, you murdered your brother. Now, Abel serves as a type of Jesus and we serve as a type of Cain. So Cain was innocent and he was murdered by his quote unquote brother. Jesus is the greater Abel. He lived his whole life and worshiped to God and we are Cain, we murdered Jesus, our brother. Jesus talks about Cain and Abel in uh, Matthew 23, 35. He talks about uh, all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel. So two things I wanna point out here. Sometimes brothers and sisters are like Cain. Sometimes people who are in the church are not in Christ. Sometimes people who are in worship with you are not in the same spirit. Sometimes they may be uh, calling you brother or sister, but they're acting like Cain. Some of you have experienced these people and religious people are the worst. They will murder you and say, praise the Lord. They will murder you and then go to church and sing songs. The question though is, what is your unrepentant sin? Cain's problem was there was a sin in his life that God had convicted him of. He refused to repent of it. He refused to tell the Lord, my heart is wrong. Uh, my motives are impure. Please forgive me. Create a new spirit and a new heart within me. Most of us would never think I'm gonna end up like Cain, but we will if we have unrepentant sin and ultimately, if we persist in that sin, that sin enters in and it ultimately destroys us and it causes us to do despicable, deplorable things, even uh, deadly things to other people. So we can't just read the story and say, I can't believe Cain would do that. We've got to ask the question, how could I be like Cain? The second is Balaam. His apostasy is motivated by greed. Uh, it's in the study guide. I, I, I tend to show my notes, but it's in uh, Numbers 22 through 24. So he is a prophet of God. A prophet of God receives a message from God and then communicates it. And they are not in any way to edit it, just deliver it. That's a prophet's job. If at any point you create your own message or you alter God's message, you're a false prophet. What happens is, God gives him a message as a prophet. And as a prophet, God says, bless these people and curse those people. Well, those people who are being cursed, they're not big fans of the prophecy. <laughs> so they come to Balaam and they're like, hey, can we switch that? Can you curse those people and bless us? He's like, no, I can't do that. Uh, that's not what God said. They're like, well, how about if we, if we make a donation to the ministry? He's like, no. They're like, how about we add a zero? No, add a zero. They're like, well, I'll pray about it. And add another zero, they're like, yeah, I'll cash the check. Jesus says negative things about a hireling. A hireling is someone who is a hired hand and they'll say or do whatever they get paid most for. They're for sale. So all of a sudden he starts saying, thus says the Lord, and he is saying what everyone wants to hear. True or false in our day, you can make a lot of money saying things that are not true. 
Like mainstream media is gonna love you. Social media is gonna platform you. I mean, if we're still on Facebook, it's a miracle. I got tagged this week for hate speech um, and they said they're gonna permanently delete me because of their community standards. And I thought it was funny they had standards. Anyways, <laughs> so, so if you're watching, go to realfaith.com, I'll still be there. Um, so, so within that, in our day, there are certain people like, We'll, we'll platform you, we'll promote you. The algorithms will benefit you. The media will love you. The book deals will flow to you. Just tell everyone what they wanna hear and they'll pay well for that. That's what he does. So uh, Balaam, the false prophet, he is uh, on his donkey and he is going to give false prophecy. And Jesus shows up to stop him. So in the middle of the road shows up someone called the angel of the Lord. When an angel of the Lord shows up, it's usually a created being, it's an angel. When the angel of the Lord shows up, angel means messenger, it's usually Jesus Christ before he was born of the Virgin Mary. So Jesus looks at Balaam, he's like, I'm, not, I'm coming down. Like, I'm, I'm not putting up with this. And so Jesus comes down, Jesus is in the middle of the road and guess what? The donkey sees him, but not the prophet. So what this means is the donkey is the more mature discerning believer. <laughs> and so the donkey's like, Jesus is right there. And see, uh, Balaam at this point is so blind to the presence of God that he doesn't realize and recognize that he's in the presence of God. And so what happens then is he starts beating his donkey. He wants his donkey to stay in the road and the, and the donkey's like, I'm not running over Jesus. You know, and so the donkey's up against the side of the wall and then, and then Balaam is beating his donkey and doesn't see Jesus. So then uh, the donkey starts talking to Balaam. And I, I just tell you, I don't know why, every time I watch Shrek and I hear Eddie Murphy's voice with the donkey, I think it sounded like that. I think it sounded exactly. So then the donkey, Eddie Murphy through the donkey, rebukes the prophet. He's like, why are you beating me? Jesus is in the middle of the road, right? And so it just goes to show that the donkey is actually the true prophet and the prophet is actually the donkey. Anyways, just something to think about. So what happens then is, um, is that ultimately Balaam is rebuked and, and at the end of the day, he doesn't change his ways and so God ends his life. Uh, in Joshua 13, 22, it talks about Balaam, son of Beor, the one who practiced divination was killed by the sword. You could start out quoting the Bible and then start contradicting the Bible. You could start saying, thus saith the Lord, and then saying things that the Lord never said. You could start out that the Holy Spirit is helping you and then demonic spirits have been invited by you. In 2 Peter 2.15, it talks about forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who love gain from wrongdoing. Um, let me just say this, if you're a Christian, there's gonna be a point where you contradicting God is going to benefit you. And if you do, you will walk away from his anointing and blessing. You'll be like Esau selling your birthright for a bowl of soup. Revelation 2.14 at the end, Jesus says, I have a few things against the church at Pergamum. You hold to the teaching of Balaam, you eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. True or false in our day, uh, false prophets who contradict the Bible and encourage people to have whatever sex they want are very popular and tend to make good money and not get canceled. Nothing changes. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened, but what always happens. And today Balaam has got a lot of sons and daughters. Now, again, what happens is when we come to these Old Testament stories, there's always people who say, you know, these are, there's an old, this is not true, this is myth, this is just scary stories, it's just primitive cultures, we've evolved beyond that, we don't believe in that kind of superstitious supernatural. And then archeologists will go to the places that the Bible says and they will dig up the things that the Bible tells. I love archeology span because it confirms the Bible. And so here, let me show this to you. Um, in 1967, there was an archeological dig at the central Jordan Valley. And uh, it recounts a vision received by quote, Balaam, son of Beor, a seer of the gods. It's from the eighth or ninth century. So they go to the place that Balaam lived 
They do the archeological dig and they find an inscription and it mentions Balaam, son of Beor, eight to 900 years before Jesus walked on the earth because he's a real false prophet and the Bible is true. And then the question would be for you, how many zeros would it take for you to compromise your Christian convictions? See, some of you right now, people at work don't know you're a Christian because that would, that would hurt your employment. Right now, some of you are in school and you haven't really let people know you believe in Jesus because that would hurt your grades. Some of you on social media, it's like you're in the Christian Witness Protection Program. You're not gonna let anybody know. <laughs> And at the end of the day, if you are not willing to speak that which is true, you're just like Balaam. And if you're willing to say something that is untrue because it profits you, you're just like Balaam. Number three, Korah and his apostasy is motivated by power from number 16. So uh, the story of Korah is this. Um, there were two leaders, Moses and Aaron, that God had chosen if you read the book of Exodus and Numbers, these are the two senior leaders that God had clearly chosen. Moses is first in command, uh, Aaron is second in command. Now, they were saying and doing what God told them to say and do, but the people didn't like it. You ever seen that? You ever seen that where they're like, yeah, I mean, I'll just tell you as a pastor, just because you quote a verse doesn't mean you make a friend. I'm just telling you that's how it works. And so the people are like, we don't like what they're saying and doing and how they're leading. So then a guy named Korah rises up and he's like, well, how about if you join me, we create a faction of division and insurrection and rebellion and we, we remove, right? We remove Moses and Aaron and then I'll be your leader and you guys just tell me what you want and that's what we'll do. So he leads an insurrection and a rebellion. And what he's doing, he's following Satan's example because the first disregard, dishonor, disobedience toward authority and the first coup attempt was in heaven. In Revelation 12, seven through nine, it says that there was a war in heaven and, and, and Satan, who was a created being, decided, you know what? I don't like the way that uh, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are running things. Why don't you guys, Angels become demons, join my team, we'll declare war on them. Maybe we can dethrone them and we can replace them. And what he's doing is demonic. And so God sent a plague and killed 14,700 people. And let me say this, if you want to be rebellious, if you want to be divisive, if you want to be factious, if you want to have the church or the Bible be the way that you want it to be, you'll always find somebody who's willing to be your leader. And you'll always find some people that'll join your unholy alliance. And what he's saying is all of this is demonic. And so for you and I, we've got to check our heart. We've got to ask ourselves, okay, am I, am I motive? Do I have unrepentant sin that drives my decision-making? Do I have a, a love for money that drives my decision-making? Do I have control and power issues that drive my decision-making? And, um, and what you can't do is just read the Bible and say, um, I can't believe that people would behave like that. We've got to then look at it as a mirror and ask, how could I become like that? God saved me from myself. So there are counterfeits and this includes counterfeit Christians. Um, Jude 12 and 13. So we looked at uh, the counterfeit Trinity. Here's the counterfeit Christians. Jude 12 and 13. These are hidden reefs at your love feast. Love feasts are, they're like parties and everybody gets together, but they're not sinning. And God's people should throw parties to practice for heaven. Okay. We, we get this all the time. They're like, why do you guys throw such big parties? Because we're practicing for the biggest party you've ever seen. Uh, it's the kingdom of God. And when we meet Jesus, it's going to be nothing but a good time forever. And so God's people get together and we, we celebrate and throw parties in joyful ways that are honorable to the Lord. What he says is, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Let me just point out the obvious. Jude is probably the most negative book in the Bible. Like if you're, if, you're, if you're a pessimist and Eeyore is your spirit animal, um, <laughs> you're like, Jude's it. And so what he does here, he tells us not only what God is for, but what God is against, okay? 
And what he's saying here is uh, that some people who are in the church or would claim to be Christians, they're like clouds that don't rain. A cloud that doesn't rain is pointless. We live in Arizona, right? Like what good, is a, what good is a dry cloud? We need zero of those. We need no clouds or wet clouds. What we don't need are dry clouds. They're pointless, amen? In addition, trees that don't bloom. What good is a tree that doesn't bloom? It's no good at all, it's fruitless. If the tree doesn't bear any fruit, then it's a worthless tree. Seas that puke up lifeless foam. How many of you have gone for a walk on the beach and it just seems like, I don't know, it just seems like the, the, the ocean ate bad Chinese food. You're like, the whole beach is just, it's just all puked up with foam, it's gross. Do you know what you can do with that? Nothing, it's, it's just, it, it is worthless. You're not like, oh, I'm gonna collect it. Don't, um, you know, I, I'm gonna give it as a present. Please don't, it's worthless. And then lastly, he talks about stars leading nowhere. In their day, like our day, there were stars and they would help kind of navigate your path. You could find directions, but these are wandering stars, which means that they are directionless. What he's saying is this, and I, I know that this is, uh, this is dark, but it's helpful. Some people are pointless, fruitless, worthless, and directionless. Everybody's like a snowflake. <laughs> nah. Some people would say that they're Christians, but you look at their life, it's pointless. They would be in church, but they're fruitless. Uh, they have a lot of opinions, but they're worthless. And if you follow them, good luck, because they're directionless. And what he says is these people come into the church to feast on, to feast with you. And the Bible uses this language. There are, um, there are shepherds that protect and love the sheep. There are sheep that are vulnerable. And then there are wolves who try to get in to eat the sheep. What he's saying here, they're wolves. And, and what happens is in the church, the, the sheep are usually a little naive. And they're like, well, they said they loved us. Yeah, that's what wolves say to sheep. They really love you with barbecue sauce, okay? Um, they're coming in to take your money, to take your joy, to take your life, to take your family. These are people that come just to take, not to give, okay? Um, and then he's gonna talk uh, in a moment about angels. And throughout the book of Jude, he talks five times about angels and demons. Here's why. They're our example. Angels and demons made their decisions before we were created, okay? And the angels decided we're gonna obey the Lord and the demons decided we're not. And now we have to make a decision. And am I gonna do like the angels did and obey the Lord or am I gonna do like the demons did and disobey the Lord? And he's gonna talk about angels. And let me just mention this briefly because there was a study that came out recently and it's kind of curious. Um, belief in angels and God. 79% of Americans believe in God. Um, next slide, please, if you've got it. And then 69% uh, believe in angels, 58% believe in hell, and 56% believe, believe in the devil. So here's what you find. People are like, we believe in God and angels in heaven. You're like, what about Satan and demons in hell? They're like, oh, I don't know. Uh, and so what you need to understand is just like there are people in our world that are good and evil, the same is true in the unseen realm and the spirit world. So you need to be two things, discerning and discriminating. Right? Discerning, and dis discerning is, is this good or evil? Is this for God or against God? Is this right or wrong? And as you discern, then you can discriminate. And, and one of the worst things that we've said in our culture is you should never discriminate. Well, there's sometimes you should. Sometimes you're like, uh, they wanna drink and drive. Answer, no, we discriminate against drinking and driving. Um, they're a registered sex offender. Can they work in the nursery with the kids? You're being judgy. Yes, I am. Uh, because that's discerning and discri Now, some discrimination is altogether evil, but, but to be discerning requires discriminating. I said this before, like, do we allow people to smoke in a hospital? No, go outside with the nurses. I mean, that's just how it is, you know? That's how it works. And so what he's talking about here is you can't be a gullible, naive, vulnerable person. You can't assume that everyone is good and everything is true and everywhere is safe. You need to be discerning. Otherwise you end up with a counterfeit church. Jude 14 through 16. 
It was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones. The 10,000 holy ones, that's an angelic army coming to end sin, to put, to put dictators in the grave, to bring evil to an end, to raise the dead, to heal the sick and to usher in eternity. You just need to know this friend, our world is broken and it will be until Jesus returns. Now that doesn't mean you have to be broken. You can be a healed person in a broken world. You can be a healthy person in a sick world. You can be a hopeful person in a fearful world. But it, it, it's not that we have the ability or capacity to lift the curse and to bring heaven on earth. We can't have heaven unless we have Jesus and Jesus brings heaven with him. That's what it's saying. Um, goes on to say, uh, to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they've committed in an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They're loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. He's not talking here about non-Christians and people who say, I don't know Jesus. He's talking about people who say they're Christians and they're anti-Christ. And they come into the church and they confuse the believers. And so um, he uses this language of ungodly and ungodliness five times. You know what that means? They're wrong. Their behavior is unacceptable. Their, their beliefs are unacceptable. And we live in a day where we're like, well, you know, I mean, everybody gets to believe what they wanna believe and behave how they wanna behave, unless you're a Christian. And then what you're saying is, there is a God who is in authority over me. So what I believe and how I behave is under his authority. I don't believe what I want. I don't behave how I want. I wanna honor him and obey him. And what he says is uh, there are first deeds of ungodliness. Let me just say this. I, I, I love, I know this is a dark message, right? I mean, this is not like the safe for the whole family verse of the day kind of book. I know that. But if you wanna do something ungodly, can you find somebody who will say, the Lord's okay with that? I, actually, I pulled some verses out of context and you know, I did a little origami and look, I, I made an answer. If you want to do something that is wrong, if you want to believe something that is false, there are people that are paid good money to give you exactly what you want. But God says those are deeds of ungodliness. Number two, harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We live in a day when even those who would say that they are Christians say things that are absolutely offensive to God. I was reading, um, I won't say the, the mainstream news outlet recently, and they're like, um, Christian pastor um, makes biblical argument for abortion. It's like, uh, kindling is lying would have been my headline. It's like, no, that's no. But see, they platform that person because what they're saying offends God. And they're saying exactly what those who hate God wanna hear. We live in a day when everything that was sacred is now opposed, discouraged and attacked sometimes by people who say that they're Christians or even say that they're Christian leaders or worse yet, say that they're pastors. Unbelievable things. Um, number three, grumblers, always complaining, always got a problem. It's the offense of the day. And just, you know, this is what drives social media. Every day it's like, what are we hurt or upset about today? Let's vote. Okay. All right, all right, let's all go over here and just scream all day then drink all night, then try again tomorrow. And, and, it, and it's, it creates mental health. But these are grumblers and it's, it's always attacking, it's always criticizing, it's always opposing the things of God. And, and then what, I love this next one, he talks about malcontents. And this in the original language of the Hebrew, it's a funny word, it's a mockery. It's people who make terrible decisions, wreck their life, and then declare themselves to be hurting victims. That's exactly what it means. It's an American, okay, that's what it is. 
So I was thinking about it. There was a, a really well-known boxer some years ago, heavyweight champion, and he went to throw an uppercut and he missed his opponent and he punched himself <laughs> right in the face. Okay? That's a malcontent. So let's say, let's say this guy then called the police. He's like, 911, I've been assaulted. I've been assaulted. Oh my gosh, cops show up. Okay, what happened? I got punched right in the face. Well, who did it? I did. <laughs> you're not a victim, you're an idiot. You punched yourself in the face. That's what a malcontent is. I don't believe in God. I don't believe the Bible. I, I, I think there's a lot of genders. I, I, you know, I don't believe in police. I don't want police. Uh-oh, they robbed me and now I need the police. You know, it's just, you keep punching. We don't need a border. Everybody's a drug addict. Hey, how come we don't have a border? It's just, it's, anyways. Anyways, okay. Um, right now, all the malcontents are reporting me on Facebook. So anyways, um, he talks about loudmouth boasters. These people get a lot of attention. They have massive platforms. People listen to them and they seem very confident. Like we have a new kind of Christianity. We, we've got new interpretations of the Bible. We, we, have a, we, we, can, we can remove the line between the church and the world and we can lift human potential. And you're like, no. And lastly, they show favoritism to gain advantage. Ultimately, it's just always about the power and the money. They're like, okay, well, what will grow the base and the platform and what will monetize the content or what will pay the bills? That's, that's what motivates it. And what motivates it ultimately is not glory to him, but glory to me. And it's not at the end. You know what? I just wanna say what God says and do what God commands. And I, I'm gonna wait until I stand before the Lord. And I just wanna hear well done, good and faithful servant. And I'm gonna go through a little bit of hell on my way to heaven, but I can't wait to see Jesus. Um, Jude's day was very dark. Our day is very dark. Jude's day had a very strong pressure for the church to compromise or to close. You and I are sensing and feeling that same tension, amen? I mean, I'm way off my notes, but like, how many of you, when you walk into the world, just like, I feel like I'm walking into war. It feels like everything is against what my God says and who my God is. It's because that's the world, we're the church. That's not our home, that's our mission field. Um, this is a weird sermon. I'm not sure it's any good if I'm honest with you, but um, I appreciate my wife laughing. Um, um, thank you, sweetheart. Um, find a gal with low expectations, a high pain tolerance, and the gift of encouragement. Um, that's the key to successful ministry. Um, I'm just gonna, um, we'll bring the band up. They're gonna do awesome and fix this hot mess. <laughs> but let me just, um, I'm gonna read something to you. And, uh, and I was just thinking about it. If I, if I was the devil, if I was the father of lies, here's what, here's what I would do. Um, and I believe this is the contend. The contend is who and what are you fighting against? And ultimately, what is the spirit behind them? Because the war isn't against flesh and blood, but powers, principalities, and spirits. Um, I would attack human life physically starting in the womb. I would defund law enforcement. I would escalate murder, open the border, decriminalize hard drugs, and drive people to mental health and depression so that they kill themselves. I would attack men getting young men addicted to porn, video games, vaping, and laziness. I would, re I would remove young men from the workforce. I would keep them from launching into manhood. I would cause them to be overmothered, underfathered, and dependent on the government from womb to tomb. I would attack the family by separating sex, marriage, gender, and sexuality, making marriage and gender meaningless. I would have academic elites guided by deceiving spirits recast marriage and family as an antiquated, oppressive, and racist institution. I would cut off generations of children from their fathers so that men love sex, but not women and children. 
Children with a bitter father womb would then become dependent on the government instead of a dad who loves them. I would attack people spiritually by closing the church globally and replacing the spirit of God with a spirit of fear so that people did not return to church once those churches opened. I would weaponize media and social media to promote lies about Christian leaders, boosting any sins or minor mistakes while suppressing all evil done by apostates. I would write school curriculum that treated the Bible as hate speech and anyone who believed it as a dangerous bigot. I would get people so addicted to drugs, alcohol, social media, and porn that they would fry the brain that God gave them with neural pathways deeply worn towards sickness and death. I would write the Psychological Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders to mention the soul zero times so that God, demons, and the Holy Spirit, along with his deliverance, were not even considered as a possibility in helping hurting people. I would attack leadership and authority and promote anarchy. I would send a riotous spirit of hate to cause people to rebel against God, scripture, parents, police officers, soldiers, and any past leaders that did good for the culture. I would attack future legacies by having a generation of children sexually abused, mentally traumatized, and sexualized at a young age. I would use fear, social media, education, and peer pressure to create depression and mental health confusion. I would evangelize an entire generation to take blockers toward their hormones and a lifetime of hormone supplements to deny their God-given gender and create mental and physical brokenness. I would castrate healthy children and give the state authority to seize custody from their parents to mutilate their genitalia in the name of care. If anyone stood against this, I would promote the lie that if they don't allow a child to make an irreversible lifelong decision, then the child will commit suicide and they are a murderer. I would attack the Christian church so that no one was left to contend for the faith. I would promote cowardly Christian leaders, starting with young, poorly read, naive ministry leaders in the worship and creative departments who spend more money on their wardrobe than their library. I would encourage them to deconstruct the faith twist the word of God and deceive an entire generation into apostasy. I would have weak pulpits replace hard-hitting truth with soft-selling chats. I would feed churchgoers a steady diet of spiritual garbage and God-like motivational talk so that they knew more about their personality traits than God's divine attributes. I would send demonic sons of Judas who is a troublemaker in ungodly, excuse me, I would send demonic sons of Judas to the church and denominational boards to cancel and fire prophetic pastors and tell the lie that anyone who is a troublemaker is ungodly, unloving, and unkind. In short, I would convince churchgoers that to be a good Christian is to be nothing like Christ who was crucified. I would pull no punches on Christians all week, but I would have their pastors pull punches in the pulpit and not fight for them or teach them how to fight and I would call all of this progress. Jude's fight is our fight. Jude's issues are our issues, and Jude's demons are our demons. Um, I'm gonna bring the band up. I know you're all feeling encouraged, now you wanna sing. Um, So, um, So what Jude is saying is it's war out there in the world, but it's worship in here in the church. And that we come in here to worship so that we can be strengthened and filled and encouraged that we can go out there and endure the war so that we can reach the lost. And so what I wanna do is a word of encouragement. What Jude has done to this point, he's looked entirely at the horizontal. He's like, here's what's going on in the world. And just emotionally, viscerally, it feels very familiar. You're like, that feels like where we're living. Yeah. And then what he does at the end of the book, he goes from the horizontal to the vertical. And he says, okay, let's look at the world. Now let's look up to the Lord. And there are three things I wanna say, and then I'm just gonna read scripture over you as a closing prayer. Number one, there is a God over this world and his name is Jesus Christ, amen? There is a God over this world and his name is Jesus Christ. Number two, there is a God coming to judge this world and he happens to be our God. His name is Jesus Christ. And number three, we will contend for the faith until we see Jesus by sight. Let me close with this. 
Here's what he says at the end of the book. And this is to encourage you. This is to strengthen you. This is to motivate you to contend for the faith and not compromise your faith. He says in the, in the last days, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly desire. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit, but you, you and you and you, but you beloved, God loves you. You're his child. He forgives you. He saves you. He seeks you. He adores you. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He never fails you. He never abandons you. He loves you. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and we're going to sing in a moment, and that is how we pray together in the Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Do not forget the love of God. Do not doubt the love of God. Live in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy without fear. Now to him. It's going to talk about Jesus. The last word goes to Jesus. The last word comes from Jesus. Now to him who is able to keep you. You're not going to be apostate. You're gonna be disciples. You're not gonna fall away. You're gonna stay strong. You're not gonna give up. You're not gonna give in. You're gonna see the finish line. He who began a good work in you is faithful. He will see it through to the point of completion. I promise you that. To keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God. There's only one God. There's only one God. He happens to be our savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Be glory. We're gonna glorify him. We're gonna thank him. We're gonna follow him. We're gonna trust him. Majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now 